Catherine, thank you very much. And let me start by really thanking the organizers um, who've done such a fantastic job uh, organizing this uh, webinar. This is uh, great to be able to engage uh, with the fellow speakers and uh, with the audience as well. So uh, today I'd like to say a few words on the principle of prevention in international environmental law with a specific focus on the geographical scope of a preventive obligation. As we know, international environmental law is based on the willingness to avoid environmental harm before it happens, based on the idea that we should avoid harm um, from occurring rather than repairing the damage. So it is uh, generally acknowledged that uh, this preventive principle is customary international law, having found its origins in the landmark award of the Trailsmater case, and then having consolidated in the form of principle 21 of the Stockholm Declaration. For the purposes of this presentation, the three fundamental components of a principle of prevention as expressed in principle 21 uh, are quite important. Um, as we know, the first component is one that says that states have sovereign rights to exploit their own natural resources. So very much a principle focus on the sovereignty of the state when it comes to its environment within its domestic territory. And then two more environment focused uh, components with a traditional prohibition to cause transboundary harm to other states and an even more environment friendly uh, component about protecting the environment in the global commons. What we are seeing really is that even in this principle of prevention, sovereignty preservation rem remains central. So we have on the one hand, the sovereignty of a state to exploit its resources that is balanced with the sovereignty of other states um, to be and their right to be free from external interferences. However, if we look at uh, the landmark advisory opinion on environment and human rights of the, of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights from 2017, uh, what we see here is that the advisory opinion says that states have a duty to prevent damage to the environment, and I quote, both inside and outside their territory. So this affirmation actually raises questions about the geographical scope of a preventive duty, as we are indeed going beyond the transboundary context in which Principle 21 has operated so far. So what I'd like to do today is to assess whether and if so, under which circumstances, states might have a duty to prevent harm to the environment within their jurisdiction or control, even when no external impact can be reasonably foreseen. So I will start with some brief preliminary uh, methodological remarks. I will then very briefly out outline a number of either environmental or human rights obligations that might be applicable in a purely domestic context. And then I will explain why does this matter? Why does this matter that we have actually an obligation, that state might have an obligation to prevent harm only within the domestic territory? So understandably, the thesis of the extension of a spatial scope of prevention is not uncontroversial. Uh, it is challenging the traditional conception of prevention as a norm designed to preserve the territorial integrity of states. Um, and while there's a lot of doctrinal discussions about the fact that the concept of sovereignty might be, uh, might be reshaped by a, glo a globalized world, um, we see that the proposition that a state um, can use its resources at its sees fit is rarely actually openly challenged. Um, however, at the same time, if we look at some codification works uh, from the UN Environment Programme, from the IUCN Environment and Development Covenant, as well as some of the legal scholarship, for instance, if you look at the textbook of Sands and Peel, um, we see here that there's often an allusion to the applicability of prevention in a purely domestic context. Um, so what I'd like to do today is to look under which circumstances can we say that such an obligation can 
apply. This is raising a fundamental question that relates to whether a norm exists in customary international law, and if so, how do we actually go about in trying to identify uh, such um, the existence of such a customary norm? So I do not seek to undertake a comprehensive assessment of state practice or opinion juris, but I, what I'd like to do today is to highlight a number of obligations that are actually asking states already um, to uh, preserve their environment within their domestic territory. So if we look at international environmental obligations, um, what we see is that um, sovereignty again remains uh, quite important and this is those obligations are very much driven uh, by a willingness to preserve sovereignty and not the environment as such. Um, however, we can identify three sets of obligations uh, that create a domestic obligation to prevent um, harm. The first one is uh, if we transpose the international no harm rule to a domestic setting in a situation where an administrative entity in a state, such as a province, a canton or land, causes environmental harm to the territory of another domestic uh, administrative entity within that same state. Um, so this is what we have seen in, a, in relation to a, a number of uh, decisions from domestic courts in which domestic courts have actually applied, applied the international no harm rule, looking for instance at the 12th Melta case or the ILC prevention articles in a purely domestic setting. So they've used this no harm rule as an inspiration to actually regulate and try to protect the environment within their own territory. Such transposition obviously has its own uh, limits. It works uh, better if we are in a federal system. Uh, it might not work all the time because it's not really creating an overall obligation to avoid harm um, within the territory of the state. A second possibility is to look at the emerging obligations of sustainable use of natural resources uh, that has been considered to be an emerging norm under customary international law by the International Law Association, for instance. Um, again, here we are only looking at how states are using their resources within their domestic territory, and we are, in a sense, including this preventive rationale in that obligation, but a preventive rationale that has nevertheless to be balanced with the other components of sustainability, economic and social uh, considerations. So it means that the preventive obligation um, does not have, that will not prevail over necessarily over other considerations. And then the third component um, and the one that is perhaps uh, more uh, convincing is uh, more relates to the general duties to protect the environment uh, that we see in certain uh, international treaties uh, in Article 192 of the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea that creates a broad obligation to prevent, to preserve the environment irrespective of where harm might happen, which means that it also includes the domestic territory of a state. Um, same thing with the UN uh, International Water Force Treaty or uh, even the work that uh, is being done by the ILC on the protection of the atmosphere where we can also find that kind of broad environmental obligation. The second approach is to look also uh, at human rights uh, duties that in a sense are better suited when we're trying to identify state obligations in the context of, a purely, uh, of purely domestic activities. Um, and in this context, um, we can look at the obligation to prevent and mitigate disasters to protect people as uh, has been identified uh, in the work of International uh, Law Commission, uh, an obligation that uh, has actually, that finds its background in the environmental principle of prevention, but that has been applied only uh, in a pure uh, domestic context, irrespective of external impacts. Uh, the two obligations are obviously linked, um, but they are also uh, very different as when we're talking about disasters, we are talking about um, uh, an emergency, a focus on protecting the population and not the environment as such. Um, and then 
a second type of obligations uh, that relates to uh, the um, increasingly important uh, case law that we have on the relationship between human rights and the environment. Um, here again, an implicit obligation to prevent harm um, in as much as uh, certain activities might affect the enjoyment of existing uh, human rights. This jurisprudence is often uh, implicit when it comes to recognizing this obligation of prevention. But for instance, if we look at uh, the latest judgment of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights um, from uh, February 2020 um, in La Carrondrat against Argentina, what we see in this judgment is that there is a specific reference based on the advisory opinion uh, that I mentioned previously about the preventive duty to avoid environmental damage and about how this preventive duty applies in a strictly domestic context. So why does this uh, matter? Well, it matters because basically if we're only looking at principle 21 as an expression of uh, the prevention principle, um, well, we actually see that this is not enough and that there, are, there might be some uh, emerging duties to protect the environment also within a state's domestic uh, territory. Um, this kind of objective standing in which prevention applies irrespective of where environmental harm might happen uh, has consequences both uh, legal and symbolic. Legally speaking, if we have an territorial norm of prevention, it means that states will have an obligation to avoid environmental damage in disputed areas. And this is what has been recognized uh, by the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea in Ghana versus Cote d'Ivoire or in the South China Sea arbitration points. So this is quite important because it means that we have obligations that are applicable irrespective of sovereignty considerations. In addition, and perhaps more controversially, it also means that we could perhaps justify a right to take unilateral preventive measures which allows the objective of environmental protection to actually prevail over the right of a state to be free from external interferences. Theoretically speaking, the objective standing is significant because it's really signaling a change in the logic that drives international law in the context of environmental protection. It is making prevention applicable irrespective of sovereignty considerations and hence better able to value the environment per se. Thank you.